My guest is Eric Anderson. He's an economist, and he's our resident economist at the Common Sense Canadian, and you can see him at the Canadian.org. Uh, Eric, thanks for being with me. Oh, thanks, Rafe. Wonderful afternoon you picked. Isn't it? You know, there's a swirl going on in the energy field now. For a long, long time, it was not really talked about by very many people, but there's just all sorts of stuff out there. You've got to look hard to find the information that you can trust. Have you got any kind of suggestions, clues? Well, I think that uh, one of the insights that have been recently published is, is the insight that John Calvert and Mark uh, Lee have provided us with on the history of, uh, recent history of electrical energy uh, demand and usage in the province of British Columbia. It's hard to come by though, and that's, I just read that stuff and it's excellent, even I can understand it. <laughs> but you know, when you look around at, at the government side of these things, the in industry side, they don't seem to have anything by way of independent evidence. And yet we who are opposed to these things are accused of being outrageous and so on and so forth. Yet we have the facts. Well, this is a nice thing to see though. It, it raises the level of discussion to one where we refer to and use evidence evidence on the record and in the case of uh, John and Mark they've given us a real insight using evidence and I can't stress enough how important it is to think into the future from a base of solid evidence. Well you know I get into trouble every Monday morning by criticizing my liberal for saying why don't you do some research now, I think the answer is there's none available to her that suits her, her point of view. But I don't mean just her, I mean the Liberal Party and those who are on that side of the, the energy debate. Very true, and, uh, and as, as you said at the beginning, the target is moving, and it's moving very fast with big, big numbers. And that is the scary part about this whole discussion. I want to talk to you about almost everything that we've been dealing with over the last couple of years, Eric, but I want to start out with a, the question of, of how hydro does its forecasts and so on. When I was in, in government, uh, it was just an, an easy rule of thumb. Whatever hydro forecast was probably two-thirds or one-third too high, and you were, went with that. But now it's, it seems to be a little more complicated than that. How, is the pro, how does the processing work? Well, uh, the, the process works as a twofold operation. One is the pure straight vanilla kind where you use the notion of per capita consumption which is driven by population numbers that the province uh, publishes and you can go on their website and find them. They're easy to find and they're really well done, presented beautifully. And uh, also uh, the the sort of commercial side of the province, which is like retail square footage and the number of uh, units of electrical energy that, and other kinds of energy that are used by those users. There are two groups. And uh, the person who's in charge of producing the, the forecast, uh, David Enns, is, uh, is very comfortable with the numbers that he's working with. He uses his starting point as outside numbers that he then and his team work over. So the part of the forecast that they produce that affects the residential customer like you and I and the commercial customer like the store down the street or or a big block store it's all pure vanilla and it's easy to do and very reliable. It doesn't move in big swings in the course of uh, any period of time, short period of time. I get a sense that there's a however coming. The however is the other part of the forecast, which is the part I would characterize as highly, highly speculative. And that is providing energy, electrical energy, to large industrial customers that either exist or are wanting to come into the province under whatever circumstances they're being invited into. That of the whole, like John and Mark have pointed out, maybe six, eight years ago, they, they took 40% uh, of the in-province consumption of electrical energy. Over the course of the last four or five years, their portion has shrunk to 30%. Now, 
that tells me that regardless of what the province and the hydro use as incentives to try and bring in industrial customers, we're not getting them by giving them beneficial and, in my view, subsidized rates. They're not showing up. They're not responding. And that's really well documented in history. It's not something new and different. There's a book called White Gold, which uh, is available to anybody who goes to a library. And that gentleman is really good at documenting the storyline that has been around in Canada, BC included, for the last 40 or 50 years, where you know, if we build over capacity, we're going to have this wonderful opportunity to bring in secondary value-added kind of industries to the provinces. It hasn't happened. He's got evidence to prove that. Why isn't it happening? Well, because the ownership of many of these uh, businesses reside elsewhere. They have an interest in keeping their own people employed at value-added production. Not, not British Columbians, not Canadians. It's, it's also been kicked around for several decades now, a concept of continental energy. I want to get to that in a moment because yep. you really scared me with this, but just before we get there, is it fair to say that Alberta takes advantage of this in the sense it's much more industry friendly, particularly to the oil and natural gas and, and that sort of stuff than we are, and that they're lo logically going to get head offices and so on there because they're uh, with pals. Well, that that's fine up to a point, but that's not uh, that's not value-added uh, no. manufacturing. No. I mean, value-added manufacturing is the things where we take raw materials and, and do something. Like in the case of the woods industry, we, we refine the product. We don't just ship raw logs. We do something with the logs beyond that in here to employ people in British Columbia at better rates than minimum wage. Eric, just before we move on to another topic, I think we should have mentioned John Calvert's book, Liquid Gold, which is the Bible when it comes to the private river situation. Now, let's move on to uh, another thing, and I'll put it this way. I had always felt that the people could rise as one and make their own energy policy in due course by putting people that they want into office through the polls and all the rest of it. But I'm told now that there's an organization uh, whose diminutive is NERC, which brings a lot of what I've just said into doubt, and we British Columbians may have very little choice indeed as to what happens to our energy policy. Tell us about that. Well, a forerunner to uh, North American Electric Reliability Corporation. That's uh, NERC. That's abbreviated to NERC. Yeah. I know there's one word left off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But who cares? Who cares? <laughs> was FERC. And uh, that was uh, brought into being in the uh, 50s, 60s in the United States as a uh, uh, child of the uh, National Energy uh, Agency there. And they, they really um, were doing their business uh, more on moral suasion. And they also um, would, would provide allowances for export of electrical energy into the United States to producers such as BC Hydro and others on the basis that there was a degree of reciprocity that, that customers in Canada might be approached by producers in the United States and that uh, the transmission lines would be there to facilitate such a business. No matter who owned the transmission lines. Yeah, yeah. They, they'd obviously pay a tariff for using them, but it, yeah. it, it was not blocked out. In 2006, um, under a direction from uh, President Bush, the organization was trained, cha changed into this North American Electric Reliability Corporation in the sort of late spring of 2006. The CIF Certificate of Incorporation is here, if you want to see it, anybody can see it, it's pretty straightforward. Almost simultaneously, uh, the Government of Canada directed the National Energy Board to strike a memorandum of understanding with NERC, which was basically an endorsement that NERC had some meaning in Canada. Now because of the uh, um, constitutional relationships between Canada and the provinces, Canada itself couldn't 
enter into any agreement with NERC. Now, NERC was set up to manage, at the wholesale level, the production and control of electricity throughout North America. So, Mexico, the U.S., and Canada. And they would have the exclusive mandate to do that, I gather. Once they're in, others are out, including there, governments? There's only one NERC. And so, uh, that mandate came with a feature of enforceability, which in, in your history as a lawyer, you know that means you go to court and you pay a fine if you don't do what somebody tells you to do. And that's exactly what this was about. NERC achieved something amazing. They achieved the ability, once the agreements were all in place, to control the producers of wholesale level electricity in North America. You mean where we the people through our elected representatives would be able to go to power corporations and others in the big business and say you do this or else you do that or else uh, we demand you do this etc. That was in essence given over to NERC and the provinces there and the federal government to some extent they lost uh, the authority that they had given away. Well it was uh, I think it was more of an engineered package. The federal government I believe in, in concert with the theme of the North American Free Trade Agreement, wanted to have a North American continental-wide control of electrical energy. Now, the spin for that has been always that this is one way we, we don't get blackouts and brownouts. But that is a spin, to be truthful. It, 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 it doesn't fit right, doesn't smell right, doesn't pass any smell test that I can imagine anybody coming up with. Amongst other things, we haven't had those to worry about, so why would we have to be concerned about that worry, if it exists at all, surely is in California, New York, Eastern States, and so on. Quite correct. I mean... Uh, so why are we taking on the responsibility well, for something that is not bothering us? Well, it was, a, uh, it was a condition of doing business as an exporter to the United States. Pure and simple. If you wanted to do business in the United States with your surplus energy, you had to conform to this new structure. And in fact, most of Canada is now under agreements with NERC that are legally enforceable. And if, uh, if the NERC representations to the producers are not met as to price, quantity, and timing, then there is a, a, a fine to be paid, and it's enforceable in Canada. Who are these people, this NERC, this shadowy group? <laughs> <laughs> it seems to be shadowy to, to me. It has been up until recently, anyway. Well, um, there, uh, there's a few people that are fronting it. Uh, they're called trustees. We have two in Canada, one in British Columbia. And um, otherwise, uh, there's no ownership disclosure. And, and there's no financial statements made with their annual statements. So it's, it's a bit, if you want a parallel, it's a new version of the Federal Reserve System, which is privately owned, doesn't declare its, its income for tax purposes in the United States. Nobody in the United States has legal jurisdiction of the, uh, over the Federal Reserve System, and uh, it's totally secret. Are you saying to us, Eric, that Instead of going out and voting for people that we think are going to do the best job in terms of the energy field, that we should all go down to NERC on our hands and knees and say, please, sir, please, sir, may we have this, please, sir? Because that's the way it sounds. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, we've given away sovereignty in an enormous fashion. We've given ourselves no authority to manage our own house. Why don't people know about this? Because the people who are running it don't want you to. That's basically it. Nobody wants to uh, admit to this organization existing or having any control. I mean, they, if you ask anybody at NERC about how much uh, they've collected in fines, they won't tell you. It's in the millions and millions of dollars, but they won't tell you that. And where does it go? They won't tell you that either. Where are our MLAs and our MPs and our cabinet ministers and people that should be telling us about these things? Because as I understand you, Eric, they might just as well have made a formal treaty. The effect is the same. 
Well, I'm, I'm not in a position to answer because I haven't seen any answers forthcoming from them. Um, it's a rhetorical we've, question, we, I, I guess. I know. We've, yeah. we've introduced the topic to uh, a few of the uh, members of the legislature, but there's been uh, nothing said that I've read. Let's see if this segues properly, Eric. Let's go back and take a look at our private river system here and the reason for the, inter the uh, IPPs, uh, the independent power producers. Now, I would look at that now in the light of what you told me and said this is more than just a government with a Fraser Institute mentality. This is a much bigger thing than that. This goes to what Ralph Klein and all these people were doing buzzing around the states and that the genesis of this terrible program may not have come as I had thought it came, but comes actually from pressure on a, on a multinational uh, level. Uh, I think you'd be right in saying that. Uh, the, you know, the amount of overbuild for the demand that we know about, for sure, doesn't match up. John and Mark have correctly written a, 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 a good presentation of history of oversupply looking at it from a from a financial point of view just just and a and a energy unit point of view the current forecast that hydro is presenting to the public the one that i'm most familiar with which was last year about this time so there's a new one now or shortly has about 14,000 extra saleable usable units of electricity in its program by 2017. We are currently and have been running the province on about 50,000 units with actual decreases in the last few years. Financially, since 06, the amount of capital that Hydro has deployed that they're willing to show in their audited statements is 70% more at the same time the global con consumption, the demand, recorded demand by hydro, is down by 5%. That doesn't so, compute. So, you know, it almost means that they have now given the province a financial headache that they get the same amount of energy for double the amount of investment capital, which is mostly borrowed money, which has to be paid back. Well, Eric, does this mean, uh, let us suppose for sake of argument, that the New Democrats got in on the next election in, in 2013, and they went to the people during the election and said, what we're going to do is we're going to shut down all these private, the new, well, new private power things, going to like, take a long, hard look at the other ones that are already in existence, while somebody in, across the line in the United States is laughing, saying, oh, no, you're not going to do that at all. You may think you're going to do that, but we want more power, more rivers. We're going to get them, like it or not. Could be. Could be. I, I think that uh, the uh, New Decra Democratic Party is probably not fully conversant with the enormity of this problem. Uh, I think, you know, uh, John Cal uh, Horgan has, has rightly said on record that they want to uh, re examine the issues, uh, and, and rightly should, to see if there's any uh, legal uh, impact improprieties, but it, there's not enough energy or passion about this transgression of, of, of abuse of the public trust. If I read, read you correctly, the actual decision as to what capacity of electricity British Columbia will produce in the, in the future will not only be with the provincial government, but maybe from outside forces like NERC. It could well be and probably will be. but. You have also to fold in a deliberate plan of overproduction. Along with overproduction, and this is documented in uh, white gold, it's gone throughout Canada for decades, situations of overproduction, deliberate overproduction, with imagined benefits that are going to come back, totally never showing up on the record by deliberately increasing your productive capacity, what you're doing is you're setting yourself up to be a hostage to your lenders. And if you are a hostage to your lenders, as we now have become because of debt, we're going to be stuck 
playing a game where we are sellers in a buyer's market, which is probably what NERC was always intending and always wishes for. They want us to be so needy of cash flow that we're going to have to behave maybe just like Enron behaved. Well, this is equivalent to what we uh, kidded in a way the government about before, the, their new business theory of buying high and selling low. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> yes, yeah, but if that's what's happening here, if we're building up an oversupply, obviously we're doing exactly the same thing. Yep. Why? I can understand why NERC would like it, and I can understand why consumers would like it, but why do we do it? Why, as a, as a reasonably intelligent race of people, do we do this? Well, there's got to be uh, people who are driving the bus that have direct personal benefits that are associated with vested interests that are associated with this uh, program. It could, that's the only explanation. If you're looking for an explanation of one that's in the public interest, there is no way you can present it and then see the public interest. So you, uh, economist Eric Anderson, are saying we are deliberately creating more electricity we need than we need, and that is obviously a stupid thing to do if we expect to make money out of it, and we may not be doing that entirely on our own uh, efforts. It may be coming from outside. Yeah. But, you know, it's, again, going back to the Enron analogy, the Auditor General has said publicly that BC Hydro and the government are practicing, he didn't use the word fraudulent, but questionable uh, accounting practices. Enron was the quintessential fraud. They defrauded their investors, they defrauded their security associations in, in, the, in the United States. They defrauded their, their business clients. And the way they did it was they pretended that non-cash revenue that they could create was revenue that they could book and create the fiction of a profitable company when none such existed. By the time they imploded, they had, according to uh, post uh, bankruptcy uh, proceedings and investigations, they had five billion of worthless paper, it was basically borrowed money that they had circulated through their clever system, devised partly by Andy Fastow, as, as income statements. Not dissimilar in BC Hydro's case are the use of these rate regulated asset accounts. They bring in yet to be delivered cash as revenues and then pay out a dividend to the provincial government pretending they earned the money, which was never really money they earned. There was no cash involved. So what they're doing, Eric, is they're incurring large obligations. We're not talking about capital building things now. We're talking about ordinary everyday operations. They're, they're owed an awful lot of money for various different things. They're now taking that and saying, Eric Anderson, Rafe Mayor, you are the taxpayers in this province, then you're the ratepayers, and you're going to have to pay this. Since you're going to have to pay it, let's make it into a nice little instrument that, that looks like it's owed from Eric and Rafe to BC Hydro, and we'll call it an asset. Yep, that's exactly right. It's still a debt to all the people in BC. Yeah. They just haven't got around to figuring that out. I mean, if you add the $2.2 billion that the auditor pointed out was there last year to the total liability package of 18.6, you're $20 billion in real obligations to be paid. Now, and you're showing a lot of that as an asset on your books. Well, 2.2, yeah. and the Auditor General says it's going to be more. He says numbers like five in a, few, in a couple of years. You know, Eric, you, you get into a feeling of Alice in Wonderland here, and I, I often uh, feel when I'm trying to explain this in speeches or articles, and I know you must do the same thing, that nobody's going to believe you because this is just so damn stupid, nobody would ever do it. But when you look at what you said about NERC and start looking at what we're talking about now, the suggestion that BC Hydro is being deliberately bankrupted suddenly takes on some, some sense. Yeah. Eric, from what you've been telling me about the internal workings of BC Hydro and the accounting stuff and so on, NERC and the private rivers and so on, I'm getting the impression that the notion that BC Hydro is being deliberately bankrupted, it may not be all that far out. 
because everything that's happening, which you've told me, ha is contributing uh, to a bankruptcy. The only question is whether or not it's deliberate. Well, uh, Rafe, that, that brings us to some unpleasant speculation, and, and, and it's around the issue of how, the question is how intelligent, financially, intellectually intelligent, are the people who are in control of the paycheck, the, the checkbook, okay? And I, I can't bring myself to think that the, the uh, people who are in charge at BC Hydro and, and uh, the finance department, for instance, in Victoria, are financially illiterate. I just don't accept that. To me, I, they're just like everyone else. I mean, they've got good educations. They've, they've done things in their lives that they should be rightly proud of. And I think they're in the positions they are for some of that reason. So when it comes to saying, oh, this is just a matter of bad policy or this is just a matter of, of uh, being mistaken or, or even stupid, I don't accept that because there's too much information available out in the public we all have access to that makes what is going on seriously questionable. Eric, when I speak to people, I often get eyes rolling heavenward when I tell them about the private power situation where we are allowing private companies to destroy our rivers, to create electricity, and oftentimes, most of the time, when BC Hydro doesn't need it, being forced nevertheless, or Hydro being forced nevertheless to take that, either take it or pay for it. When I say this is the situation, the BC Hydro has just got to lose bundles and bundles of money, and they're in hawk over $40 billion now, People just look at me as if to say, well, no, come on, Rafe. I mean, nobody's, nobody's going to do anything quite that stupid. But that's exactly what's happening. Well, you come back to the question of stupid or deliberate. Yeah. Well, and and the, the stupid I'm part... I'm trying to zero in on that. The stupid part does not compute. I don't buy that. Don't so it's deliberate. Now, why would somebody basically take a really good asset and run it into the ditch, financially speaking? And I can only think that the, the answer lies somewhere in the background where there's individual vested interests of a serious nature that are compromising the judgments of people, or there's another group that are calling the shots, and it could be a shadowy group like NERC uh, and, and the people who control NERC, not, not the people who are trustees, but the people who control it. So maybe what we're doing here is getting a window on what some people have suggested is happening is a takeover of the North American energy package. Electricity, gas, oil, the whole enchilada in one bag by a few people. One part of what we've been talking about has always puzzled me too, Eric, and this, this bothers people when I tell them that in days gone by, BC Hydro declared a very substantial dividend to the BC government. I think in the last NDP year it was almost a billion dollars, but always in hundreds of millions of dollars. Not only is that money now gone, no longer there, you can trace it in a sense so that it goes straight down to large corporations outside BC borders. The money we would normally get for our schools, hospitals, and so on are going into the bank accounts of the Warren Buffetts of the world. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. If, like, that's going, astonishing. Going back to the, to the uh, the revenue statements of BC Hydro in the last 10 years, if you pulled away the cash income from the paper income, it would probably shock the pants off you. And, uh, and it's because what you said just now, the people who have these take or pay contracts that are secret, let's make no mistake, they are secret. Because I've tried getting them from the BC Utilities Commission and got completely blocked out and I've got a letter to prove it. They are secret, and they're secret for a reason. People in Victoria and people who have these contracts don't want us to know. You know, the reason given is sort of commercial reasons. These people are all bidding separately on these rights, etc. so we can't let any one of them know what the other one is doing. Uh, the words for that, I, I can't repeat on a program like that, but it's something like <laughs> barnyard droppings. 
Uh, am I not right in saying these people aren't competing at all? For one thing, they're all represented by the same law lawyers for the IPP, et cetera, and they're all as thick as thieves. And there's no need to keep the contract secret because some other bidder will be compromised at all. That's just, that's just rubbish. Well, every project is unto itself. It's a, it's a one-off project. You don't go and build a cookie cutter up here uh, on uh, Toba Inlet to one you've built up on the Squamish, you know, yeah. you don't. They're all cookie cutter, made to order projects. So keeping them secret, is that's rubbish. That's total rubbish. Well, one thing you know for sure, there's a lawyer in town who I won't mention that knows the intimate details of each and every one of those contracts and is involved in each and every one of those contracts. And since his clients have a right to have information from him, you've got to assume that that information is going. I'm only saying this, Eric, to put to rest this notion that we, we must have secrecy in the corporate world or it would be unfair. In fact, the very reverse is the case. Well, when you think about NERC, that's a restraint of trade business. Yeah. That's what it is. It's restraint of trade. It's designed to, to annihilate competition in an otherwise competitive world. It happens to be about electricity. This theme of controlling the information and becoming and not disclosing ownership and and being secret on all fronts is a theme that we are now seeing blossom in North America and this is but one refrain of it. Eric before we leave this and I want to get on to uh, liquid natural gas uh, LNG in just a moment just on the on the pricing from the private companies do I understand correctly, and we do know the prices, we found the prices, they've been leaked, they've been brown envelopes, and nobody's denied it. So we know the 120, whatever particular dollar mark it is. Is it right to say that BC Hydro, A, must take that power or must, must uh, use it, one or the other, and secondly, if they take it, or either way, I suppose, it's, it co it's costing them twice or more what they could get it for on the export market, and several times more than what they can make it for themselves. That's the correct characterization. Uh, John and Mark uh, featured some of that information in their report, which is really I'm grateful for because it's another authentication of what we've been hearing. Uh, from inside uh, uh, BC Hydro itself, uh, last uh, December I had a conversation with uh, somebody there and they agreed that uh, the industrial rate the preferred industrial rate was somewhere around $30 a unit, while the marginal cost of new production, so you can imagine all the new production we're talking about, that 14,000 gigawatt hour years, is going to be somewhere in the region of $130, $135, plus transmission costs, which are not somewhat incidental, they're big. Yeah. So, and what if they make it themselves instead of uh, taking it well, the the contradiction there is that uh, in legacy dam production, they're probably at maybe all in costs of uh, $25. Uh, and uh, that's one of the, uh, the little carrots that the provincial government has given uh, traditional large in industries in British Columbia. They tie them into the, what they call a legacy rates. And if you go to the, uh, the sort of trans-border uh, trading operation between here and all the states in Western United States. At this time of the year, which is the prime generation period of the year, for all of the same reasons, it's snow melt and so yeah, on. Yeah. There are times when the energy that are that's offered is negative. In other words, the producer is paying somebody to take the energy from them. And there's a reason for that. The reason is that they can't afford to shut down their particular plant or production because it it's too costly to shut down and spool up again. They got to keep going. Are you talking or, about the, the private power producers? Well, anybody yeah, is oh, a producer yeah, or, yeah. using coal yeah, okay. or nuclear energy. Yeah. Uh, these plants have to keep moving. They, they, they don't shut down. It's like shutting down a paper mill. It's not easy. Do I understand too that at this particular moment as we sit here on this sunny day, BC Hydro is spilling water over the top of its dams, not making electricity because they're forced to buy it from private producers? 
Correct. Yeah, it's unbelievable. And worse than that, we're actually not just spilling water, which sounds like it's without a cost, but we're losing a resource that we could be making money off of. Yeah. And, and we're also creating an environmental situation that they don't usually have this time of the year, but that's another story. Yeah.